out of everything that came out in 2020. Igarashi's new season in the form of Go surprisingly ended up becoming my favorite thing of the year. What ended up appearing as a remake became a show full of new mysteries and things to solve, while also bringing in new crowds to interact with old crowds. I loved interacting with the community and sharing my new finds with you guys. I found streaming to Twitch my reactions to the new episodes a ton of fun. Like the last stream where I caught up to Satoko Washi was probably some of the most genuine fun I had last year. And I overall just really enjoyed myself with the season. After making nearly a dozen videos on Go alone, I could not have been more excited for the release of Sotsu in the summer season. In fact, Sotsu was the only thing I was looking forward to going into that season. It was one of the only things actually I was looking forward to in 2021 as a whole. I didn't care for Komi Can't Communicate, didn't care about Chainsaw Man, or even the last season of Attack on Titan. My eyes were completely and solely on how Higurashi would conclude its newest thrilling season. That's why it pains me to say that my excitement nearly disappeared completely after the release of its very first episode. And that is not a joke literally the first episode of the season, and I was already slowing down my hype train for the series. Following an explosive season like Go was going to be a hard thing to do, so I expected Sotsu to not be as great as Go, but to still, you know, be good. However, I wasn't expecting the series to be the disappointment that it ended up being. Sotsu is easily the weakest canon series of the franchise, and in my opinion, was not good. I found myself growing more and more frustrated as I watched Sotsu, and I ended up complaining every time a new episode came out in my Discord server when the season first started. Ah, oh, it doesn't make sense! Oh, it doesn't make sense at all! Oh, I hate this series so much. A lot of people were determined that the series would get better and tried to express that to me, but I did not see it happening. My frustration got so bad that I ended up dropping the series after episode 6, and I didn't pick it up again until probably around episode 11 or 12 came out. I was just really not happy with this season. Now, here we are after the last episode, and it seems a large part of the community is extremely upset. And I've had a few people come and tell me that I was right from the start about Sotsu, which, I'm not gonna lie, makes me feel pretty good about myself, but it's still terrible that this ended up happening and that the community is let down. Of course, there are also a lot of people that did enjoy this season, and a lot of people that didn't think too much of it. I'm actually surprised how split the community seems to be on how they feel about Sotsu, especially from this poll that I did on my channel. There are percentages everywhere for how people feel about it. Personally though, I am in the camp of it not being good. To help you guys understand my feelings on this season, I've broken this video down into sections with a friend of mine named Bastard who will be frequently appearing throughout the video. He's another content creator on the platform who makes videos that are way more detailed than mine, so be sure to check him out after you watch this video. Seriously, he makes some good stuff. Anyways, like I was saying, this video will be broken into parts, the pros about Sotsu, and the cons about Sotsu. Because, you know, Sotsu isn't entirely bad. There are some good things about it that I tolerated or that I enjoyed, but there are a lot of glaring issues with it. So with that being said, join me today as we talk about why Higurashi Sotsu was a letdown. <laughs> First, I figure why not start out things on a positive note with how the horror was handled. The story in Go was awesome, but the horror lacked quite a bit in comparison to something like the Dean anime. Some of the faces and expressions come off as incredibly goofy, or scenes ended up not feeling as suspenseful. Most instances of killing were shown entirely off screen, or were full of a lot of cartoony looking blood. Overall, Go was just not eerie or very creepy. Sotsu managed to up the horror game a fair bit compared to Go, with scenes such as Rena going to kill Rena feeling unnerving or unsettling. It feels like a proper horror movie here in this sequence as she stalks Rena and Rena tries to escape and you know does the classic horror movie slip. And there are a few other sequences that I did find a little thrilling. I am very happy they were able to up the horror here because I'm personally a very big horror fan, so this was a nice touch to me. If there is one thing that Passion has done well, it is the soundtrack. Bringing back classics from the original Dean anime to maximize scenes that could be nostalgic to us viewers, or strengthening scenes with the chilly soundtrack that Dean has made. They also have made a few good tracks of their own, and easily the best part of Sotsu is its opening. Analogy is an absolute banger, and even while I wasn't planning to watch the show, I would find myself occasionally indulging in the awesome opening. They really outdid themselves with this one. I didn't think anything would top I believe what you said, and I was proved wrong in the very next season. This isn't even including the fact that us fans finally got to hear one of the most legendary and infamous Higurashi tracks in the entire series, Dear You, 
and its finale. I believe this is the first time we have ever heard the song in any of the anime adaptations, and it was very heartwarming to finally hear it being played. Now, this is a bit more of a neutral take rather than a pro or a con. After almost 20 years of Higurashi's existence, fans finally got to see Satoko's brother, Satoshi, wake up in a canonical property for the first time ever since he was diagnosed with level 5 of Hinamizawa Syndrome. I know there are a lot of Satoshi fans out there in the Higurashi community for some reason, I don't know why, and I'm happy that you guys got to see your boy back. However, I also really feel this didn't need to happen, and it sort of undermines Satoko's arc and Satoko Washi. She moved past waiting for him to wake up and to become more reliant on herself so she could bring Rika back, almost entirely letting him go. With that being the case, him waking up is sort of unnecessary. Like, again, yeah. It's nice to have him back, and it removes the last possible thread that could remain for this series. However, why did he need to come back? What purpose does this really end up serving, besides being maybe some fan service? I don't know, it's nice again that you guys got your boy back, but it definitely did not rub me the right way. Now for some of the cons. Oh boy, this is where the dislikes are gonna start coming in. <laughs> where Go's strength was its storytelling, building of reveals, and moments that would change the way we looked at characters or events forever, Sotsu lacked in this department. Immensely. It wasn't even close, to be honest. In fact, I find it almost impossible that the man Ryukishi himself was involved in the writing of this script at all. Sotsu does the bare minimum for almost absolutely everything. Almost all of my initial theory videos on Higurashi Go were correct. That should be a huge red flag because at the time, I was someone really new to the series. I hardly knew anything about Higurashi. I knew Umineko existed, and I had never once heard of Sukonia. Yet, I almost got everything that happened in these answer arcs correct. I was of course wrong about a few things, such as Keiichi's mom cheating. Uh, which was a fun theory in hindsight, but the fact that 85% of my theories were right is a testament to how minimalistic they made their story. This isn't including the ending. I don't think any of us saw that shonen-esque ending coming at all. They also kept hammering the nail on what we already knew as if we didn't already know it, while they completely ignore and don't even really mention a lot of the things we don't know much about. Like, let's take a look at the Rena arc for starters, Oni Akushihen. It started off somewhat strong, but it quickly fell apart with some very flawed logic. Like the sequence leading up to Rena's injection is a good example. Suddenly, Rena has a puzzled look on her face and goes to leave the room to go to the nurse's office. Naturally, we all assumed this was her remembering a prior event and she was going to go home and this would start a chain of events. But no. No, she actually apparently does go to take a nap in the nurse's office. This comes off as incredibly random, since Rena showed no signs of drowsiness before this. So why would she go take a nap? Then, Satoko goes to eject Rena while she's asleep, which also doesn't wake her up. We see that she feels it because she winces, but it doesn't wake her up, despite her being in most likely a very light sleep since she literally went to sleep like minutes ago probably. So what the hell? What gives? Rena going to take a nap and not waking up and the perfect place for Satoko to inject her in isn't good writing. This is convenient writing. None of this feels deserved, or warranted, or built up to it all. It just happens. It's happening purely for the sake of the rest of the plot. This arc would not happen if this super convenient scene did not happen. Now, I know some people here might try to argue, Ah, oh, it's because of Lambda Delta. Lambda Delta certainly made this happen. You could argue that if there was more instances of Umineko in the story, or if there was, like, deadass confirmation and all that Lambda Delta was involved. But as far as we are aware, and what is given to us, Lambda Delta has absolutely nothing to do with this. Even with this, I'm sure that there will be some people that try to say that Santako's alter ego, or her second self from episode 10, was Lambda Delta. But once again, you can't really say that. Up until this point, Higurashi, Sotsu, and Go have been completely solvable by Higurashi properties. If you look at Umineko, Umineko is also completely solvable with Umineko properties. Both Higurashi and Umineko reference each other, but they don't make it integral parts of their stories. So Satoko's alter ego or second personality here really is just the cliche, I'm evil, killing the cliche, I'm good side so that the evil side becomes dominant. Could this be Lambda Delta? Sure, it could. 
that's very possible. However, it would not make sense given how these stories unfold. They are always solvable with just the property that it is. The references don't really go further than references. They are not usually integral pieces of the property or of the narrative. If someone had never seen Umineko or had never read Umineko, they would have no idea who Lambda Delta is. So to them, this would just be a good Satoko versus a bad Satoko thing. But anyways, if we go back to Rena's injection scene, if we look at this purely from a Higurashi standpoint without Umineko being involved at all, possibly, because who can really tell if it's involved or not? This instance here happens very conveniently for no reason. This is Higurashi. This is not Umineko. We also don't find out how Keiichi killed Rena, and we also don't learn how Keiichi survives in every arc. How the hell does he survive a billion stab wounds in the gut? For what reason does he survive bashing his head against a metal door without giving himself any serious kind of injuries? How the hell does his head not break or his skull not get crushed when he gets beat senselessly by a bat? Anyways, a little off topic again. Anyways, let's go back to what we were talking about. Oh gosh, I'm really bad at this. Then we go to the Mion arc, which, again, happens in an extremely convenient way. Mion and Satoko happen to both leave their game fun at the same time, which we knew was going to happen since it happened in the first question arc. We as an audience were curious as to what would happen though, but yet again, we're hit with the injections. Satoko injects Mion off screen in a public setting. What? We are supposed to believe that this actually happened perfectly for Satoko? There is no way that Mion didn't feel something inserting into her body and pumping shit into her when Rena felt it while she was asleep. We are also supposed to believe that no one else sees this happening when they're doing it in the middle of the street when people seem to come and flock and be super observant in this town almost all the time. This is once again, not good writing. And as more instances of convenient writing. Writing like this really angers me because Higurashi has always had good writing that unfolded in manners that made logical sense. Like I've always found myself able to understand the mental downfall of the characters in the first season or the way things happen or set up. But this? This just feels kind of disgraceful, as if they're doubting the intelligence of some of the people watching this show. The next arc, Tatariagashi, doesn't pull any big contrivance for the injection scene this time around. Satoko simply spikes the drinks of Oishi and Tepe, and then she injects Oishi while the two are asleep. Unfortunately, the bigger issue with this arc is the ending. In Go's corresponding question arc, Keiichi was shown to be attacked by Tepe. Keiichi then overpowered Tepe and killed him before collapsing and falling unconscious. In Sotsu, it turns out what actually happened is that Satoko killed Tepe, then lured Keiichi to her house where she bludgeoned him unconscious with a bat. Funny enough, Hunter did actually guess this in his Tatari Damashi video, but the way this actually plays out in Tatari Akashi makes this twist unfair from a mystery standpoint. The biggest clue that led Hunter to the assertion that Keiichi was hallucinating was the ridiculous amount of blood spatter on the walls, along with it being inconsistent with the smaller blood stains, which were also a darker shade of red. But no, everyone in Go and Sotsu just has way more blood than the average person because all the blood on the walls, including the darker shades of red, was real, and it all came from Satoko bashing Tepe's head in. It's also heavily implied that this alternate series of events is just Satoko's unreliable account given to Oishi, which is a bit of an abrupt narrative device to come up now, especially when the first two arcs played out in such a straightforward manner. The only valid clue for Tatari Damashi being an alternate series of events is the difference in blood covering Satoko's face in episodes 13 and 14 in Go. The events are possible to guess, but it's not possible to solve the mystery using the same logic as the show, as most of the clues that Hunter used ended up being irrelevant. Sotsu made Higurashi Go fall on its face as a mystery series. Go set up intricate questions and mysteries that could play out in a wide variety of ways and situations, as I discussed in my retrospect video. There were so many possibilities and almost unlimited solutions. That apparently was all thrown out the window with Satoko Washihen, where H173 was brought into the picture. Naturally, we thought Satoko might use these a few times. There's it anyway, she's going to use it every time. Nope. Sotsu took literally the most laziest way possible and made almost all the solutions to the answer arcs involve the syringes, which the way H173 acts itself is also a little bit of a retcon. H173 in the original series is used on Tomitake in every loop, and in all loops he claws his throat out, which kills him. 
This happens hours after him being ejected, always on the same day. H173 never gets close to acting like this in Sotsu. I know that some people tried to argue that H173 could react differently depending on the person it's injected to, but literally everyone in Sotsu acts and follows the same path. They get injected, they start developing Hinami Zawa Syndrome, they go crazy, they murder people. No one acts anything like how they did with Tomatake. This makes it appear as if H173 has suddenly changed to once again conveniently fit the plot of Satoko abusing him. Although there was something that was introduced in Matsuri that said that Tomotake got a vaccine to prevent him from getting H173 when he first came to the ERA Center, so some people could try to argue that maybe this was an accelerant that made H173 progress rapidly whenever he got it. However, there's no way to confirm or deny if that is the case, so there's some weird gray area with that. All of these writing issues aren't even including the sudden and forced ending, where we suddenly have Dragon Ball Z and Higurashi. It made no sense at all. None. Literally no sense. Sure, yeah, it was fun to watch. I enjoyed watching Satoko get the shit beat out of her. She deserved it. But it was horrible writing-wise, since we were suddenly thrown into the climax. All we have is build up, build up, build up, build up in the rising action, getting us to what we assume is going to be a satisfactory and cool climax, but we're just thrown right into it. And then it ends just as randomly as it started, with there being no closure, no real work for the ending. It just happens. They just said the character is made up when it doesn't feel like they really did make up. They just happen to for the sake of the plot. Satoko randomly learned her lesson after murdering her friends countless times, manipulating people, and putting people against each other. This does not resolve the conflict in the slightest. If anything, I'm extremely upset that we see Satoko being evil for an entire season and a half, and Rika suffering for a season and a half just for them to randomly come to terms with things. And on top of that, it feels like Passion just threw Dear You into the episode to pull on the heartstrings. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that love the ending of Sotsu just because they got to hear Dear You in there and it was purely just ethos catering and nostalgia pandering. Well, yes, I did put this in as a pro for Sotsu. This song had no right being played here, especially since this isn't the end of Higurashi, with there being more manga coming out and there possibly being more seasons in the future. Not only is there all this convenient writing, flawed logic, and random resolution of the conflict, that doesn't feel satisfactory. They attempt to throw in some last minute breadcrumbs for the Seven Expansion Universe theorists, and they make Rika and Satoko say an Umi Neko reference in dialogue to try and put a bow on Sotsu. That reference to me, however, just didn't do it, and I found it incredibly disappointing. It has no weight being said here, it's just purely to get people talking about the series for a little bit longer. Higurashi ended with no real resolution, there was no conclusion, it just kind of happened. In the context of Go, I still stand behind most of what I said about Satoko's character in my video on Go. Honestly, I found her to be a more compelling villain than Takano at the very least, and I'll admit, I was even interested to see how she'd interact with Rika and the others this season. But Sotsu, unfortunately, adds nothing to Satoko's character. In fact, it takes away from it. First off, Satoko's villainy was already clarified well enough in Satoko Washi, so we didn't really need the reminder this season. It's bad enough that she turned out to be the mastermind behind nearly every event in Go, but in addition, we're constantly treated to completely pointless scenes with Satoko flashing an evil grin and repeatedly stating how everything is going according to plan like some kind of comic book supervillain. If this happened once an arc, it still wouldn't add anything to the plot or her character, but this essentially happens every episode, multiple times in some episodes. I can't even find Satoko's camp villainy amusing at this point because the repetition kills any possible entertainment value. Despite this, there is a moment in Sotsu where Satoko is semi-remorseful about her actions, which is when she's about to kill Tepe in episode 10. Yeah, the the fact that Satoko is able to kill her close friends so easily but has an internal conflict over killing her former abuser is a bit odd, to say the least. But she ends up killing Tepe pretty sadistically anyway. This scene is such a terrible attempt at making Satoko sympathetic, and it only makes her character less believable. Satoko also makes some clumsy decisions when it comes to executing her plans. Satoko is no genius, trust me, I'll get to that in a little bit, 
but her actions at the end of Wata Akashi and Tatari Akashi are outright dumb. At the end of Wata Akashi, Satoko interrogates Mion about Rika's fate, and Mion tells Satoko that she killed her. Then, without seeing any direct proof of Rika's death, Satoko shoots Mion and then herself. Conveniently, things happen to work out for her, but considering she's been planning everything to a T up to this point, it's incredibly risky for Satoko to kill herself in this moment. As previously stated, if Satoko dies before Rika in a loop, that's it. She won't be able to follow the same Rika into another loop. You'd think Satoko would make absolutely sure that Rika was dead first. Satoko shooting Rika, Oishi, and then herself in front of Rena was stupid too, considering Rena could have easily remembered this in a future loop, but that also didn't happen. Because convenience. This is all bad enough, but her character takes an even greater hit in the final arc of Sotsu, Kagarashi Hen. Satoko's motivations in Go formed from several different things, such as her abandonment issues, jealousy, infrequent contact with her friends, her inability to fit in at St. Lucia, and a lack of communication between her and Rika. Which is why it baffles me to see Ryukshi zero in on the fact that Satoko hates studying. I initially scoffed at the idea that Satoko's actions were all a cause of her being too dumb to read a book. You can bet I felt some retroactive embarrassment watching these last two episodes. Yes, Satoko struggling in math class isn't the only motive of hers that comes up here, but the fact that it's coming up at all in this pivotal moment in the season, and that it eats up so much time in the argument between Rika and Satoko clearly signifies that it's a crucial point of the conflict. And after everything that Satoko has done up to this point, it's just so comical. Shion was an absolutely crucial character in the original series, being one of the main killers and victims to the Syndrome, as well as being a character tormented by guilt, regret, and the past as a whole. She ranks easily as a fan favorite, and that's why I really want to talk about how dirty they did her in this new season. Besides a few episodes, Shion was almost entirely absent from Go, a 24 episode series. Her character did not matter at all, which disappointed a lot of people, myself included. I was never the hugest fan of Shion, but of course she does have her really good and integral piece in the story of Higurashi. However, we had a lot of hope that, you know, maybe she would come back and be very important in Sotsu, since in Go she does end up caring greatly for Satoko. Without Satoshi, a lot of people speculated that she would be the one to help resolve the conflict and help Satoko realize the error in her ways, and that she would be absolutely crucial in resolving the issues presented in the series. No, not at all. Not even remotely close, in fact. Shion was in Sotsu for the sole purpose of being killed by Mion when she went level 5. That's it. Besides that, her character served almost no purpose. If you remove Shion from Go and Sotsu and had Mion kill someone else, literally nothing would change. Her character served nothing to the story at all. Speaking of serving nothing to the story at all... If a character was not Rika, Satoko, or Iwa, they almost did not matter to the overall story of Go and Sotsu. I can't believe this issue exists at all, to be honest. Ryu is known for making extremely dynamic and interesting casts of characters, with every one of them being riveting and having an extremely solid argument to why they could be someone's favorite. I'm not kidding. Someone in the community could tell me any character from Umineko, Sikonia, or Higurashi was their favorite, and I would understand it. <coughs> Except for Satoshi. <coughs> Sorry, got some coughs going on. But seriously, the casts of all his works are all so interesting, with every character having their charm, or their moment, or something that makes them relatable or memorable. This is the strongest piece of Ryu's stories, his characters. His characters are always amazing. However, his characters almost did not matter in Sotsu. Characters like Keichi, who was the reason the miracle happened in Minagaroshi, and the reason they won the game in Matsuri Bayashi, who brings people together and shows the world the power of the village he's so proud of. A man with two possible love interests, and that is always there for his friends. He did nothing in the series! This, to me, was a massive disappointment. They had Keichi remembering fragments from other arcs like crazy during Go, and in a Higurashi radio segment back before Sotsu aired, Keichi's voice actor said the way he felt about him and Sotsu was very complicated, and since it's all come out, 
I can completely see why, because he did not do anything. Literally nothing. This begs the question of why they chose to make Keiichi remember so much more in Go if nothing was going to come from it at all. Matter of fact, why the hell did they include this concept of memory accumulation? Something introduced by Yua that states that the characters around them will remember more things the more they loop, such as Tepe. This was shown happening with Tepe. That is why his redemption arc started happening. Why would they show this and make up this concept if nothing would come from it? Memory accumulation did not matter. And if they removed it from the story, nothing would change. This is an issue with a lot of things in Higurashi Go and Sotsu. It consistently breaks Chekhov's law. If you don't know what Chekhov's law is, let me go ahead and tell you that it is this concept in writing that you do not introduce something unless you plan to use it multiple times in the story or that it comes up again. The biggest example is Chekhov's shotgun, where he introduces a shotgun and the shotgun will be used later. Why does memory accumulation exist if it only served, like, one niche purpose in the episode it was introduced in? I don't know, it just kind of bugs me. That was a little off topic. Let's go talk about another club member, Rena. Rena, in my opinion, is a character that is extremely underutilized. She is my favorite character, and she is essentially the cover girl of the franchise, but all she really does is kill, act cute, and act crazy. I would have loved to see her undergo an arc of remembering past fragments, seeing her kill all those people and dying a bunch. Maybe her realizing Oyashira-sama isn't real, or her remembering killing Rina and forming a better relationship with her, or honestly really anything. Almost anything would have been fine in my opinion, as long as they tried to at least do something with her. Instead, Rena is practically still just a cover girl. There is not much else to her except for killing, acting cute, and acting crazy. Which you think would have changed after two new seasons, with there being now five installments in the series. Sure, yeah, she does help out a little bit in the resolution, but again, this does not feel deserved. It just kind of happens because, I don't know, it could have been any other character. <laughs> it could have been anybody else besides Rena. How about our next club member, the leader herself, Mion? She went level 5 for the first time this season, and how did that go? It was pretty damn uninspired, if you ask me. It was basically just Xion all over again, except this time with Mion. Besides that, she too did almost nothing and Sotsu. This, like Keiichi for me, was a giant letdown. Honestly, a bit of a missed opportunity too. Imagine if Mion, our good-hearted leader of the group, saw fragments of her killing her sister, killing Rika, and almost killing Satoko. Do you realize how much this would traumatize or change her? It would have been a fascinating arc to see happen, but once again, we are met with a whole lot of nothing. In fact, I think they're going with the Xion Yandere route is kind of cheap because Mion and Xion are two very different people. Why would they react the same exact way? just with two different guys. Feels like very lazy writing once again. Very uninspired, they could have done so much more. Even some minor characters like Rina, I feel could have been done a lot better. We're basically just force-fed that she wants to be better, but she never gets the chance to. She gets a half-assed redemption, then is murdered, and is never further elaborated on again. Tepe's redemption was good, but I wish we could have seen a little bit more of it, instead of it being something we're introduced to in Go, and then randomly it's full force and Satoko and him get along very well in Sotsu. Feels very random. Hanyu, I feel, is the most underutilized character in Go and Sotsu. She played a large role in the original, and was the reason Rika got to live through loops, but she's absent for almost all of Go and Sotsu for really no good reason, which is kind of crazy considering that she should have played a super important role in this series given how powerful she is and how integral she was to the original one. It's almost as if the writers didn't really know what to do with her. All she really did was say that she's useless and unimportant and can't really do anything for like 37 episodes, and then on the 38th one she showed up, was forced into BDSM, and then randomly beat a character that she should not have been able to beat lore-wise because Yua is supposed to be way stronger than Han Yu is. Again, this is uh, something else that feels very strange. The biggest elephant in the room for me this season, though, was Takano. She has seen what she's done in other fragments. She knows that of the people she's killed. This could have led to her acting incredibly differently, or doing new things, or like I discussed in previous videos, that maybe she could help keep Rika alive or fight against Satoko. She clearly wants to do things differently, and she wants to be better. But still, nothing was done with her character, or these newfound revelations. It just kind of happened to say, she's good now, completely. That's cool. Which also makes it a little weird because there was like that scene in episode 2 where they made Takano's reveal very dramatic, which made you think maybe she'll play a little bit of an important role, especially considering she was the main antagonist of the first season. No, nothing. And then there's Tomatake. Poor fellow was just as irrelevant as Shion in the series. Maybe more so, to be honest. Also, did you guys remember that Irei was a character? 
because uh, I sure as hell forgot he existed. He is the reason that Satoko is alive and that Satoshi isn't dead yet, yet he is not in either Go or Sotsu much at all. In fact, I don't even think he was in Sotsu longer than a minute. You'd think he'd be kind of important considering he has a very strong relationship with Satoko, uh, but no can do. The list goes on and on for almost every single character in the series, except for Satoko and Rika. I know that you can try and argue that they were the main characters and the purpose for this series, but their quarrels should have been addressed by their closest friends. You know, naturally, if your friends are fighting, your closest friends are gonna do something to stop that fighting. The game club should have been more important in the story since they are really all that both Rika and Satoko have, and Rika owes them a massive debt for letting her free. There is no reason that they should not have been more integral to the way Sotsu unfolded. This isn't even to mention, again, memory accumulation with Keiji remembering all this past stuff, him living every arc, you thinking he's going to be important? No, no, he's not. Maybe Rana could be important? No, no, she's not. Mion? No. No, she's not. Overall, I am really unhappy with how nearly the entire cast was handled in this series. Some were done worse than others, like Shion and Satoko, but the bottom line is that nearly none of them were done very well. For a story that is as character-driven as Higurashi is, that is a massive, massive problem. I'd like to add that for a series about the importance of bonds and community, it's disappointing that in Go, and especially Sotsu, the rest of the club members are just background characters to the Rika and Satoko show. Hunter mentioned how memory retention across fragments didn't end up playing into the plot of Sotsu in any meaningful way, and this brings me back to something I mentioned in my Go video. I think it would have been cool to see the rest of the club members retain memories of Satoko's acts of villainy especially since Satoko had gotten extremely cocky by the end of Tatari Akashi. It might be cheesy, but it would have been more consistent with the main theme of the series, as well as a nice callback to Matsuri Bayashi if they all teamed up with Rika to outwit Satoko somehow, instead of the mindless DBZ fight we actually got. The writing may be shaky, but by far the biggest problem with Sotsu is the pacing. It's kind of funny looking back that when Sotsu was first announced to have only 15 episodes, as opposed to Go's 24, there were some concerns about the episode count. This doesn't seem like enough to tie up all the loose ends from Go. This is gonna be rushed as hell unless there's a third season. But that did not end up being the case. Trust me, I wish that were the case here. To say Sotsu has bad pacing is an understatement. Out of Sotsu's 15 episodes, 13 are mostly just retreads of events from Go and the original series. Yep, a large majority of this season is nothing more than a glorified recap of Go, which already had the issue of reusing scenes from the original. At least Go spiced things up every now and then by including scenes from the visual novel that weren't in the Dean series or the manga. No such luck in Sotsu. The only visual novel scene in Sotsu that I can think of is the curry contest from episode 5. Not much of a plus when it's just a fleshed out version of a scene from Go. Higurashi Sotsu is the biggest exercise in redundancy I've witnessed in an anime since the Endless 8 arc in Haruhi, but at least the repetition of Endless 8 served a meta purpose in Haruhi's narrative. Something unique I can say about Sotsu is that despite how dull of an experience it is, it's bad in a way that no other anime really is. This is what an answer arc becomes when the writer has no respect for the audience's intelligence, and it's also the worst possible way to make use of the looping structure of Higurashi's narrative. The show constantly wastes time on reveals that most people could have already figured out after episode 17 of Go. The big mystery in Go was the culprit reveal, which we found out at the end of Nekodamashi. Once we see Satoko steal H-173, we can already conclude that she injected the others with it. Ryukshi did not need to take valuable time out of the season to confirm this for us. I know that in the Umineko visual novel, parts 7 and 8 were controversial among Japanese fans for not providing explicit answers to the mystery, but this? is not a solid alternative. It's difficult to believe that someone like Ryukshi, with such a passion for creating mysteries as well as the activity of solving them, would also write Sotsu, which is essentially a non-mystery. 
One good thing I can say about the pacing of Sotsu is that it did help me better appreciate Minagaroshi, because after watching this series, I think I understand what Rika was going through. Just as Rika had to experience countless world lines hoping that one would lead to a miracle, Sotsu had me strung along through countless recaps every week in the vain hope of original content at the end. And considering what we got in the last couple episodes, the Minagaroshi comparison is an apt one. Okay, but seriously, I don't think we really needed a whole season of answer arcs when the events of the series ended up being so simple. Rena going crazy? Satoko did it. Oishi going crazy? Satoko did it. Also, she killed Tepe and almost killed Keiichi. Mion going crazy? Satoko did it. Side tangent, but I want to talk about this last plot point as someone whose favorite character in the original was Mion. Before Satoko injects Mion with H173, she mentions to Aowa that Mion was the only person in the original series to have never succumbed to the severe effects of Hinamizawa Syndrome. She raises an interesting question here. What would this character that we haven't seen under the effects of level 5 prior do if level 5 is forcefully introduced? Well, as it turns out, the same thing that everyone else does. She goes crazy and kills people. What was even the point in bringing that up, aside from this being yet another instance of Sotsu making something we already know explicit, as if the audience couldn't simply figure that out on their own? Wata Akashi does a huge disservice to Mion in general, because despite being a radically different character from her sister, her actions are pretty much the same as Shion's and Mayakashi. The only difference is that Mion kills people for Keiichi instead of Satoshi. This arc was the most lazy, unimaginative way to explain explore Mion's character. I'm jumping in real quick to throw in my two cents about the pacing. Bastard laid it out pretty well. It's abysmal. The first 13 episodes of Sotsu could have been shown in like maybe four or five episodes. One episode for Rena, one or two for Mion, and three max for Tatari. Instead, it was stretched out practically as much as it could be. I don't think it's a good thing that in the technical fifth season of an anime installment, only about maybe four episodes worth in minutes of the 15 episodes is new content. At that rate, they should have just done what they did with Rey and given us a new season that's only a few episodes instead of dragging it out for 15. Or rather, they should have just cut out all the recaps and given us more of the last arc in Sotsu. I know I mentioned it earlier, but its conclusion happened so quickly and forcibly that it felt like we were given whiplash as a viewer. Literally almost any amount of more time dedicated to this last arc would have made the ending more digestible and enjoyable instead of, you know, again, getting Higu Ball Z. Go clearly had a low budget, but I think it did fine for a show with such a low budget. I can't say the same for Sotsu. Like Go, Sotsu mostly looks fine, although there are a couple janky bits of animation here and there, and some of the blood splatter effects look kind of cheap. But there aren't any moments that made me think, hey, that looked pretty nice. I said in my own video on Go that there were a couple moments, like Rika's Watanagashi dance, that I thought were pretty well directed. Apparently, Passione felt they did a good job too, because they reused that scene multiple times. This is an issue that ties in with the pacing, because a high number of reused scenes results in a high amount of recycled animation. Even if most of Sotsu looks okay, I can't give it any credit for this when most of the scenes are just lifted straight out of the previous season. After finishing Sotsu, I can assume that they were saving the budget for the last couple episodes, but that doesn't solve my problems with the animation and the rest of the show. Higurashi Sotsu is one of the biggest disappointments of 2021 to me. It didn't honestly wrap up anything that was set up and go. We don't know how Keiichi lives every arc. We don't know what the hell Yua's purpose is. We really don't get a satisfying conclusion of Satoko vs. Rika. We do not get to see Rena or Mion grow as characters. We don't get to see what a redeemed Takano would do. We don't ever get to see Tomatake or Shion. We don't get anything like that at all, and all it did was make me hate Satoko as a character. I'm glad Tepe got to be redeemed, but that in my eyes was really the only thing that Sotsu and Go succeeded at. They really did not do anything else. These are sequels that have no right to exist, and they serve no purpose by existing. 
They introduced lots of cool concepts, such as everyone remembering events and fragments more often, or some characters being different and changing and redeeming themselves, but they do nothing with these concepts. It is extremely poor writing, and tons of instances of plot convenience, and horrible, horrible pacing. All that Sotsu and Go does is throw occasional references to Sukunia and Umineko through characters and dialogue, and I really can't help but feel that my last video was right. Sotsu and Go exist purely to help sell product. All I gathered from Higurashi Go and Sotsu was that Satoko does evil smile and is a fucking awful friend. Iwa laughs and tells me to buy Sukonia, and that Umineko still has hardly anything to do with Higurashi as it did before this season came out. I know some people in the comments are gonna go, But Hunter, we got dialogue confirms that you said when we read again when something cries. Sure, we did get that. What of it? These few lines said by some of the characters can be left completely up to interpretation. In Umineko, connections are so much more concrete. We have Burn Nippon, and several panels in the manga where Burn is just straight up Rika. Even Hanyu is in the manga. Nothing like that happens in Sotsu and Go. All they do is give occasional breadcrumbs. Higurashi is supposed to be a series about self-improvement and mental health, and the bond between people, and the power of having friends that you can trust. The way they beat the original was by all coming together with the village and trusting each other. None of that happens in Sotsu. Satoko just murders her friends and makes them kill each other over and over again. Then there's a death battle with Rika, and suddenly she's redeemed. This feels dull and completely soulless. There is no bond between the people or heart in this. The message that Sotsu and Go delivers is that no matter how fucking terrible of a human and friend you are to the people around you, that you can half-acidly apologize and things will be completely fine. If anything, I think that this encourages toxic bonds and relationships. That's not a good message to put in your story. I can't really express in words how angry this season has made me. I have sat on this conclusion for days, and all I can really think of is how let down I feel. I dedicated so much time to Sotsu and Go for nothing to happen. This video was originally meant to be more neutral, but there are just way too many issues with this series. If you are watching this video and you haven't seen Go or Sotsu, please just do yourself a favor and don't watch them. Stick with the original series and do yourself a solid by reading Umineko. Now I'm gonna hand Bastard the mic so he can share his final thoughts about the series, so take it away my buddy. Thank you, Hunter. We've both been pretty harsh on Sotsu in this video, but I can't describe it as anything other than a colossal failure, as a sequel to Go, and as a Ryukshio 7 work in general. I spoke at length on how the first 13 episodes of Sotsu were pure tedium, but after all that, the last two episodes feel like a slap in the face. I initially found episode 14 refreshing when it first aired because I'd just been conditioned to expect absolutely nothing. Honestly, I wouldn't have been surprised if the last two episodes were just a recap of Satoka Washi from Rika's perspective. But aside from the ludicrous action, these last two episodes add absolutely nothing of value. And if they were going to conclude the fight between Rika and Satoko in such a schlocky way, they could have at least gone all the way with it. Throw in Lambda Delta and Burn Castell and the Fragment world, or hell, even Battler. Since Satoko Washi, there had been numerous implications that Lambda Delta, a witch from Umineko, was a being that originated from Satoko's looper personality. Much like how Burn Castell is implied to splinter off from Rika and become a separate entity herself. Satoko repeats some of the same lines of dialogue that Lambda uses, and Aowa even states that she has become a witch in Tatariyakashi. And yet, that's all that these implications are implications. You could say that Ryukshi being any more explicit than this would turn the show into some Higurashi Umineko fanfiction, as well as take away from the mystique of the witches, but at this point I don't even care because nothing memorable has happened in this entire show. It's not like episode 14 was based in realism to begin with. If you're going to jump the shark, at least go all the way with it. After all this build-up, there needs to be some kind of actual payoff. And on the topic of Eiwa, her sole purpose was as a living Umineko reference. Her design is based off of another character in Umineko, which gives the audience the false hope that there are going to be big lore reveals, but aside from that, she does nothing of interest. After she grants Satoko looper powers, she does nothing but sit on a couch, laugh, and call Rika and Satoko the greatest of storytellers, a statement that's painfully ironic in the context of Sotsu. She doesn't even do anything of note in the ending. She name drops a character from Sakonia for the second time, gets her ass kicked by Hanyu, 
going off of Umineko, this shouldn't even be in the realm of possibility, becomes Jahisama and then just pieces out. No answers, no explanation, she just vanishes from the plot as quickly as she came in. It's not like the conclusions to Satoko's or Rika's arcs are satisfying either, they just punch each other until they're done. It's not like either of them convinces the other that they're wrong or that they have some sort of epiphany while fighting, they just stop because this is the final episode and the conflict needs to come to a halt. Higurashi's always been about moving beyond the mistakes of the past, but these characters don't take any time to reflect on how their actions were wrong or what they could have done differently. All we get is a line from Mion about how friends don't need to spend all of their lives together. I more or less surmised that this was the theme this new series was going for in my Go video, but this is such a half-assed way to make Rika and Satoko come to terms with each other. I'll admit that the original Higurashi could also be a bit unrealistic in how it depicted bonds and forgiveness, but even Keiichi's dramatic friendship speech in Sumihoroboshi wasn't enough to completely tide things over for that arc, and seriously, this this is the extent of the role that the club members had in the finale, a couple lines of dialogue. When I think about the big scenes of Higurashi that resonate with me, I don't just think of two characters, I think of the cast as a whole, of Hinamizawa as a whole. I think of Keiichi and Rena realizing the value of their friends in Sumihoroboshi, of Keiichi uniting an entire village to save Satoko and Minagaroshi, of everyone coming together to stop Takano and Matsuri Bayashi. For as much as Satoko loves to talk about how awesome Hinamizawa is, I don't see any of the Hinamizawa spirit I know and love in Sotsu. This scene is supposed to be the big moment of catharsis, the thesis statement of Sotsu, and it's only a restate of a theme that already came across in Go. I just have to wonder, what was the point of it all? When I finished Go, I was genuinely excited for what the future of Higurashi had in store, but as I watched Sotsu, I gradually just stopped caring. I don't take any pleasure in shitting on Sotsu. I have a lot of love for the When They Cry series. The original Higurashi is great, and Umineko is one of my all-time favorite pieces of Japanese writing, but Sotsu just has nothing to offer. None of the characters developed, the show damaged my opinion of Satoko and Rika, and everyone else had a feeble amount of screen time. Nothing in terms of thematics was presented that hadn't already been covered in Go. It didn't even provide any additional lore for When They Cry as a whole. Higurashi Sotsu isn't only one of the biggest disappointments of 2021 for me, but as far as anime is concerned, it might be the most disappointing show I've seen. And considering how I felt about the series only a few months ago, that's a damn shame. Thanks for having me, Hunter. I'll let you finish up from here. That's about everything I had to say about Higurashi Sotsu. I hope that Bastard was able to get out everything he wanted to say about the series. I have hope that June will fix things, which is the manga sequel to Go. It apparently has nothing to do with Sotsu, so that gets me very excited because Sotsu was such a dumpster fire. Whether I cover Higurashi again or not is up in the air because I am really not happy with this franchise currently. Regardless, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I know it was long, pretty analytical, and pretty complainy, but there was just not very many things that I felt were good about Sotsu. And even when I went to go talk to other people about it, the things that they had to say that were good about it were very minimal or very hollow. Be sure to check out Bastard's channel if you haven't already. He makes some really good stuff, and I'm really happy that he was able to join me today and help me make this video. Thank you so much to the patron, Matt. My boy Matt. Love this man. And I'll see you guys again when something cries. Later. Say. Go